this video, we're going to be talking about cleaning and sanitizing and the details of how, when, and where you need to do each process. The first distinction that you need to understand for this video is the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. So cleaning is pretty much taking stuff off of surfaces. So it's taking off leftover food, soil, dirt, whatever. Sanitizing is a little different. It's going to kill bacteria. It doesn't, however, kill viruses, and it doesn't work if you haven't cleaned a surface first. So cleaning and sanitizing are usually paired together. They go hand in hand for any food contact surfaces. A lot of the surfaces in food service, however, only need cleaning because they're not coming into contact with food. Things like floors or walls or outsides of equipment. Disinfecting, on the other hand, is a much stronger process. It's at about 10 times the strength of normal sanitizing solutions. It's going to kill bacteria and viruses, so it'll kill things like flu and COVID, and even things like norovirus. But under nor normal circumstances in food service, you're not going to need it. It's needed after any bodily fluid contamination though. And after you've disinfected in food service, you have to clean and sanitize after that process. Disinfecting is super strong and can make people sick if it's not cleaned up properly. Another issue is that in the United States, we carry the term germaphobe like a badge of honor, but we go overboard on things like disinfecting because we disinfect almost everything. It's really not needed under general circumstances and we spend a lot more money on cleaning products than we actually need to going overboard. In fact, in most cases, you can actually wash and rinse a surface and end up washing away any viruses and bacteria. So, as you can tell, we don't necessarily need to disinfect in any food service operation and probably not even in your kitchen at home. In any food service operation, it's management's responsibility to create a cleaning plan. As you may have heard before, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So, you wanna make a schedule that is very specific about who when, where, and how everything is going to get cleaned. You wanna train your staff on that schedule, making sure that they understand specifically what their job is and a little bit about what others' jobs are as well and place people call out, which is pretty regular in a food service business. Supervise your staff well. Check their progress daily in the process and after they've done it to make sure that things are being done properly. And as you see, Change it up if you need to. Sometimes you'll realize that things are getting done too often or not enough, or that maybe the staff that you have isn't gifted in that particular area. So make sure that you're changing things up as you feel you need to. This is also a good place to ask the staff for their input to see what they think and if they have anything to add to the process. Your cleaning schedule is gonna include a lot of different things. Sometimes it's easiest to make a chart that details out the things that should be included. So the first thing is what gets cleaned and or sanitized. So make a list of everything in your operation that will need to be cleaned and sanitized. Don't forget things like the tops of light fixtures, windows, ventilation hoods, ice machines. Make sure that you get anything and everything that could gather dust or soil or dirt or food scraps or grease. All of these things are going to need to be included in the schedule. Some things like the outside of refrigerators or equipment or things like light fixtures or windows only need to get cleaned. They don't need the sanitation process. So making sure that you define what needs clean and sanitized and what needs only cleaned is super important. It'll save your employees a lot of time. How often it gets cleaned is important to define. Some things may only get cleaned once a month. Some things will get cleaned once a week. Some things will get cleaned multiple times a day. So making sure you have clear requirements for how often things get cleaned is going to be very helpful in determining the next step, which is who cleans it. For example, when I was in college, I worked at a restaurant and we had different things that the servers had to do each evening. So one night was cleaning the containers that held the sugar, one night was salt shakers, one night was pepper shakers. Making sure that you're very defined in who does each process is going to make sure that things don't fall between the cracks. And then finally, very specific directions about how to clean things. So making sure that you have like little cheat sheets for your employees to use to make sure that they know what processes should be followed. This is gonna make sure that at the end of the day, nothing gets forgotten and that every employee is gonna know exactly what's expected of them in this process. When you're creating your cleaning schedule, certain things are going to need to just be cleaned and certain things are going to need to be cleaned and sanitized. 
So in this next little bit, we're going to define the things that need to be cleaned and sanitized and the things that only need to be cleaned. And this is pretty much across the board for any food service operation. The things that must be cleaned and sanitized are any food contact surfaces. So we're talking dishes, any in-place equipment, things like dispensers of nacho cheese or the things that hold roller food at gas stations. If it touches food, it gets cleaned and sanitized. This also includes countertops because they may possibly come into contact with food and things like prep sinks that might end up being used to wash things like produce. It also includes dishwashers or sinks that are used to be washing dishes because those things are going to come into contact with food contact equipment. So then there are things that just need to be cleaned and this is just as important because it can prevent a lot of issues. And this is going to be any non-food contact surfaces. So the outside of equipment, like your coolers and ranges, stoves, any of your equipment, and then things like your walls and floors, and most importantly, your ventilation equipment. If ventilation equipment isn't cleaned properly, it can build up a lot of grease, and this is the reason that a lot of food service operations end up catching on fire. So as I mentioned earlier, for the most part, disinfecting isn't used unless you're coming into contact with bodily fluids in the food service industry. But it's not a bad idea to disinfect restrooms because what ends up happening with these is that they have a lot of contamination of fecal matter because that spreads whenever you flush the toilet. Unfortunately, sanitizing doesn't kill the viruses that are spread through this way. So if you disinfect your restrooms, you have less chance of spreading viruses through accidental contact. Chemicals in food service can cause issues with chemical contaminants. So there are some guidelines you need to follow for the ways that you handle them. The first of which is to keep them in the original containers or label them very, very well. Sometimes you have to move them into refill containers or things like that, but just make sure that all of them are labeled with exactly what they are. Chemicals, if they're mixed, can cause issues that are pretty severe in terms of creating gases or reactions that can be extremely dangerous. So making sure that you have them in the original containers is going to prevent a lot of problems. Keep them completely separate from food. Sometimes this means keeping them in a completely separate area, which is the ideal. And if you can't keep them in a completely separate area, you need to have some sort of partition that keeps things from dripping or going on to food or food contact surfaces such as single-use items like paper plates or cups or things like that. So making sure that it's completely apart from food is vitally important. And then finally, you want to follow any instructions on how to discard them. So some things you can't just throw in the trash can. A lot of them you can, but make sure you're consulting the directions to know exactly how to handle them so that you're not causing any issues with waste collection. For every chemical you have in your location, you're required to have safety data sheets. These are formerly known as MSDS, but now they're SDS. They're typically sent with the chemicals when they come from the company, but even if they're not, you're responsible for having them on hand. They're extremely important for making sure that you know how to handle all the chemicals in your location. These are required by OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Their job is to make sure that every workplace is safe, and so if you don't have these, you can get in trouble with them and they do have requirements for making sure that you comply with their directions, so they can even shut you down if you're not following directions properly. Safety data sheets are gonna include a lot of information about how to safely use a product, including how specifically to use it, what applications are appropriate, what to do if you swallow it, if it gets in your eyes or on your skin, and that can be different based on whatever chemical that you're encountering. The safety data sheets are also going to contain what it reacts to, so any chemical reactions that can happen, any fire risks, so what, to happen, what would happen if it's exposed to fire, manufacturer info for the particular product, the date the SDS was created, so you know if you have the most recent version, and then any hazardous ingredients that might cause issues. The requirements for cleaners are pretty simple, and this is just things that clean things, not sanitizers, disinfectants, or degreasers. So they have to be non-corrosive, meaning they won't break down metals. You always want to follow your directions that the manufacturer gives you and make sure that they are approved locally for use. And for that, you would check with your local regulatory authority. For sanitizing, the requirements are a little different, and that's because there's two types. Heat sanitizing, which is using heat to kill bacteria, and chemical, which is going to kill things using chemicals. So there's different requirements for each type. We're going to go over what those are. 
For heat sanitizing, you're only going to be doing this generally with dishes. You're not going to be heat sanitizing things like countertops or surfaces because it's not really possible. The reason for this is that for washing dishes by hand or manual washing, you have to have that surface at 171 degrees for 30 seconds. So in a sink, you're just dropping the item in there and leaving it in the sink for that length of time. It's not like chemical sanitizing where you can just dip it and the sanitizer stays on it so you don't have to leave it in there. So it's impossible pretty much to keep a surface at 171 degrees for 30 seconds by just pouring water on it. For machine washing, your sanitizing temperature is 180 and it's a little bit higher because you're not gonna have as much contact with it as you would have in soaking the dishes for that length of time. Your next category is going to be chemical sanitizing and this works a little bit differently. This is what you're going to use for almost any surface that you clean and it can also be used for sanitizing dishes as well by making a sanitizing solution in the third sink of a manual hand washing process. This can be done in a couple of different ways. It can be done either in a bucket, so you have a sanitizer bucket and you dip a cloth in it and wipe it down, and sometimes it's going to be putting a sanitizing solution into a spray bottle and spraying it. And with any cleaning or sanitizing method, make sure it's approved locally. There are certain things that are going to affect the effectiveness of chemical sanitizer. So this means that it makes it work worse or better. So the first thing that affects it is concentration, and this one is probably the most important. This is measured in parts per million, and you test this with test strips, and these have to be on hand in any food service establishment so that you know the concentration of any of your sanitizer at any point in time. You're gonna test this in the buckets, you're gonna test this in the spray bottles, Typically what a location will do is that they'll mix a whole lot at once to put in the spray bottles, but that doesn't last for a really long time, so making sure that everything is correctly done is really important. So you also want to be careful with your levels because if it's too low, it's not going to kill any bacteria, and if it's too high, that concentration can cause chemical contamination or chemical poisoning. So making sure that those levels are correct is going to make sure that everybody stays safe in terms of killing bacteria and not killing your customers. Chlorine concentration for sanitizing is going to be about 50 to 99 parts per million. So this works out to about a tablespoon of bleach in a gallon of water, much weaker than you would actually think. Most of the cleaners that we buy are disinfectant strength, which is a thousand parts per million. And this is going to be just under a third of a cup per gallon of bleach. But for food service use, you're always going to be using sanitizer unless you're cleaning up bodily fluids. You can't count on volume measurements for this though. You do need to be checking your solution with the test strips as often as possible, especially until you get used to the amounts. Most locations now have a sanitizer dispenser that attaches to a water faucet in the location. So you're going to run water and the sanitizer automatically dispenses at the correct concentration. This machinery can malfunction, however, so it's your responsibility to check the concentration each time you use it. Your next type of sanitizer you can use is iodine, and that's in an amount of 12.5 to 25 parts per million. So the concentration is lower, but a lot of places don't use this due to the fact that it can stain things. And your final approved part is quaternary ammonia, or quats. This is used a lot in bars or in places that like their glasses to be very shiny because it doesn't leave spots, but you just follow the manufacturer's directions for this one. This can vary based on the manufacturer. The temperature of the water affects chemical sanitizer effectiveness as well. But for the most part, they're most effective at 70 degrees, which is right around room temperature. So that means for the most part, you don't really have to worry about that too much when you're calculating your amounts. Contact time is a big issue with chemical sanitizers. If it's not in contact with the item for that length of time, then it's not going to work. This is why it's really important that after you apply sanitizer, you don't wipe it off. So chlorine, it takes seven seconds. Iodine and quads take 30 seconds. So making sure that that length of time is observed is gonna make sure that you kill all the bacteria possible. Water hardness and pH have an impact as well, but this varies so much based on individual manufacturer's guidelines that you just need to check your manufacturer's guidelines for the ideal levels for each of these things. So like I mentioned earlier, any of your food contact surfaces have to be cleaned and sanitized. 
and there's a few guidelines that will help you out across the board for any of these items. And the first one is that if you're cleaning any powered equipment that needs to be plugged in, unplug it first. And this is so that you don't have the added step of having to disinfect it because you got the bodily fluid of blood onto it. It's just an injury prevention thing, not really a food safety thing. Um, anytime you're washing dishes by hand, you want to make sure you clean and sanitize your sink first just to make sure that you're not introducing any additional bacteria in. And then finally, any equipment that's in constant use, things like ice cream machines, nacho cheese dispensers, drink machines, those types of things, if it's in constant use, it needs to be cleaned at least once every 24 hours. If you are a location that does close at some point during the day, just make sure it gets cleaned once a day. So next we're going to review the steps for cleaning and sanitizing any of your food contact surfaces. And this might be done on in-place equipment by just using doing all these steps individually. It might be done on dishes in a three compartment sink or um, dishwashers kind of automatically follow this process. But the first step for this is going to be to scrape or soak any of your dishes and this is just to get off any extra stuff so that you're not dirtying your wash water too quickly and it's just going to make sure that you're not ending up with more food scraps in different areas than you actually need so you're pretty much just removing any big chunks the next step is to wash and this is a little more complicated than the scraping step there's a few guidelines that you need to follow for this so the first one is that you're using soap and water usually this is going to be dishwashing soap and if you are um, doing this uh, in, a pl in place equipment, you'll just have a bowl of soapy water. That water needs to be about 110 degrees regardless of whether you're cleaning in place equipment or in the sink. And if you have in place equipment, take everything off of it you can, like any removable parts, wash those in the sink, and then in anything else you can clean in place. And then finally, if your water looks dirty, it's not getting your dishes clean, so change it out whenever it gets dirty. So step three is to rinse, and to rinse you're just using clean water. So um, if you're washing in a sink, then you just fill up that second sink with clean water and you just dip the dishes in there, move them around a little bit, make sure that they don't have any more suds or anything on them. So you wanna change out that water whenever it gets dirty or sudsy or you realize that it's not rinsing things well anymore. So step four is to sanitize, and this gets a little more complicated than the other steps just because you have options when it comes to this. The most important thing is you don't ever rinse after you sanitize or you, you also don't wanna wipe it off. You're always wanting to make sure you air dry, and we'll go more into that in a little bit, but after you sanitize, you shouldn't really be touching your dishes with anything. So as we talked about, there's two types of sanitizing, and the first one is gonna be chemical, and this is used a lot more. In this case, the dishes can be soaked, meaning they're just kind of dipped into that last sink and allowed to air dry. Or you can, if you're using in-place equipment, if tables, other surfaces, you can spray it with a sanitizing solution and let it dry, or wipe it with a sanitizing solution and let it dry. So this means that your contact time is being reached and that you are making sure that all of your concentration levels and things are good, but these are your options in terms of chemical sanitizing. So your next way you can sanitize is with heat, and this one is not used as much anymore. Um, the reason is that with manual hand washing, you have to leave it in there for 30 seconds. So you have a sink that is heated up to 180 degrees, and you have to leave it in the sink for 30 seconds or longer. For a machine, you just want to ensure all your temperatures are correct. So for manual, it's going to be 171. For machine washing, it's going to be 180. But like I said, this is not used as much, um, partially because you have a risk of injury with manual washing because you can accidentally put your hands in there. So, but knowing how these things work is really important. The contact time requirement of seven seconds for chlorine sanitation or 30 seconds for the heat sanitation is the reason why you have to have a second hand on the clock that is over your dishwashing station. So your final step is going to be to air dry and it's important to remember that by drying with a towel you can contaminate it with things from other dishes or bacteria that have grown on the towel. So you should never air towel dry anything in food service. All of your dishes need to be placed upside down so that they are in a self draining position and you leave them there until they are completely dry. 
It's also important that you have enough space to dry in for any manual washing that you're doing so that things don't have to be put away wet because that can grow bacteria, especially if things are stacked. So for a three compartment sink, you have an area that represents each of the steps. So to scrape and soak, you can have a tub that you're soaking things in. You can so soak things in a separate sink, but you're scraping and soaking in that first little table section. Then you're gonna wash in this first compartment. So that's gonna include soap and water and the water needs to be 110 degrees or higher. You rinse in the second one and this is gonna be filled with clean water and you're dipping your dishes in there until all the suds are off of it and you change that out when it becomes dirty. The third sink is gonna be the sanitize and that's gonna be either heat or chemical sanitizing. And typically you have a little, um, a little hose that goes from sanitizer into the water as it's filling. So it's important when you're filling that third sink that you're not using that faucet with the sanitizer on for the rinse water. And then for air drying, you can air dry in that little table area on the right of the sink, but a lot of people use baking racks as air drying areas just because they're larger and give you more options. It's also important to have your clock with your second hand and that's what's up top. And that just helps you sand time out your, your contact time for any of your sanitizing methods. So it's important to know when the appropriate times to wash any of your food contact surfaces are. And the most obvious one is after it's been used. So if you are finished using it, you just wash it after it's been used. Your next thing is if you change your task or change your foods. And that's just to make sure you don't have any cross-contamination happening. If you're interrupted, so if you have to leave the prep area for any reason, going to the restroom, dealing with customers, those types of things. And then every four hours if you're doing a task continuously, so if you are chopping onions for four hours, which I hope you wouldn't be, but if you are, you would completely wash, rinse, and sanitize everything that you've used and then start with new stuff. Dishwashers have slightly different guidelines, and as a reminder, these are different than the dishwashers you use at home in that they take a lot less time to operate. So the first thing is you want to clean those regularly, making sure that you're taking out any food scraps in the bottoms. There's little trays that catch those, but as a prevention method, you want to scrape any dishes before you put them in just so that it has more opportunity to clean those items off and so that you don't have a buildup of a ton of food scraps in the bottom. You also want to load it so that the water can reach all the surfaces, so things like glasses need to be upside down, plates don't need to be stacked too closely together. Just make sure that water can reach everything. You also want to make sure you air dry everything completely before you stack it up, so sometimes you need to leave it in the trays to dry for a while before you put those items away. And then finally, you want to make sure you're checking all of your temperatures for your water and then your concentrations for any of your cleaning and sanitizing chemicals on a regular basis, not just with the gauges, but also with thermometers and test strips. When it comes to chemical sanitizing in dishwashers, there's a couple of requirements as well. You don't have a specific temperature requirement for chemical sanitizing, however. Sometimes if the water's too hot, it can bake on food, and so you wanna make sure that you're using the correct temperature to make sure it gets clean before it gets sanitized. Follow any instructions that are with your machine or on your chemicals to make sure that everything is working properly and then check regularly with your strips and on the machine and making sure that your machine settings are accurate for what the strips are indicating. Heat sanitizing has a few guidelines as well. The first one is that your water for heat sanitizing in a dishwasher needs to be 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is gonna make sure that it kills any bacteria. It's a little higher than manual washing just because it's gonna have a little less contact time. If you have a stationary rack, which is the type that you slide the dishes in and then pull the cover down and let it run, that the temperature requirement is 165 degrees. You want to check with maximum registering tape, which you stick onto a dish and it turns a certain color when it gets the correct temperature, or with a maximum registering thermometer. The thermometers and strips are going to indicate the highest temperature that the water reaches, so it makes sure that things are accurate. So once your dishes are clean, you have a few guidelines you need to follow to store them. Any shelving that you're storing dishes on has to be six inches off the ground to prevent pest contamination. All of your glasses have to be upside down and your flatware needs to be handle up so that you're not handling what the customers 
are going to be eating off of. Everywhere that you're storing your dishes and any carts that you use for dishes need to be cleaned regularly so that you're not contaminating clean items. And then all of your equipment needs to be covered until it's being used. This way you're not going to have things like dust building up on them that you have to clean off later. So the next thing we're going to talk about is to have a plan for cleaning up any bodily fluids. And this happens if someone gets sick, has an accident, or gets cut. The most important part about this is to have a plan, to make sure that you have a procedure in place that your employees can access easily that tells you exactly how to clean up after any of these items. So first of all, you need to have a plan to contain any fluids and particles. So a lot of times this is going to be sprinkling some sort of absorber on there, but just to make sure that you're containing things and it's not spreading. The next step is that you want to disinfect it and then after you disinfect in food service, you have to clean and sanitize after that. So making sure that your employees know which chemicals to use and how to use them is important. What equipment is used and how it will be cleaned is important as well because if you're using a mop to mop up the floor, then you don't want to use that later on in the kitchen. So making sure you know how to clean that equipment and treat it after it's been used in this type of application. And then what PPE is needed for staff, and that's personal protective equipment, and you've heard that term a lot lately most likely, but that's just things like masks or gloves or the bunny suits or those types of things that you put on to make sure that they're protected, and then um, how the staff will know what to do, and a lot of times this is in things like cheat sheets because it's not something you're using every day. You want to make sure they have access to that information. And then finally, how to keep customers away from that particular area so that they're not becoming at risk for contamination. So after your food workers have cleaned up something like that, you might want to make sure that you know whether they should be excluded or restricted if they haven't been properly protected in the process. You also want to have a plan for how and when to remove sick customers in a polite but quick way so that you're not risking anybody else in the location getting sick. And then you also wanna make sure that you have a plan for how the plan is used. So do you grab the cheat sheet? Which equipment do you gather? And those types of things. And the final step is making sure that your cleaning supplies are stored and treated in the way that they should be. So there's a few guidelines for the way that this should be done. The first thing is to make sure all your chemicals are able to be seen well. So the storage area should be well lit and the areas in which you're cleaning should be well lit. You wanna have hooks for brooms and mops so they can drain. A lot of smells can build up overnight, and so you wanna make sure that they're easily able to dry. You need to have a sink that's used for cleaning only, so this means that you're not going to have any chemical contamination on any of the food that you're using. You'll also need to have a floor drain that is for mop water, so this is pretty much a concrete sink on the floor and that's gonna be the only place that you're going to dump your mop water. You don't wanna dump mop water in things like toilets or any other sinks. You may want to air dry your towels before you put them in the dirty bins because they can start to smell and grow bacteria if they're left in those bins wet. Storing your mops and other cleaning tools on hooks to dry is going to prevent bacterial buildup these things can grow a lot of smells overnight, so doing things like using fresh mop heads on a regular basis is gonna help you a lot. All of your buckets need to be cleaned and then air dried overnight just to make sure that you're not building up bacteria in those. Thanks for joining us in this description of cleaning and sanitizing guidelines, and thank you for joining us for our 10-part food safety series.